ahead and start recording this. And then um, I'll give you, I don't believe you need too much in the way of, of introduction to this week's lab. It's, it's just more getting used to what's an acid, what's a base, and how these solutions sort of work. Um, and I think that in general, you should be able to follow along with this one pretty well. Um, but I'm just going to give you one of these, these specific concepts that's really tricky for people um, <clears throat> is basically one step beyond finding a concentration. Um, so finding a concentration, we've done some practice with that. Um, pH is just a very specific way of measuring concentration that's still related to molarity. So we, when we measure pH in a lab, we usually do it with, with a little electrode that we stick in the solution, and it measures what the, uh, what the conductivity of the solution is generally. Um, and that conductivity, we can actually use that to calculate a pH based on some engineering principles and some, some other um, really cool equations, frankly. Um, but what we're actually measuring with pH is, is the concentration of H3O plus or the concentration of H plus. So when you put an acid in water, like we've mentioned before, you get, so we use HCl as an example. When you put HCl in water, um, a lot of times we wind up writing it just this way as it dissociating like it's an ionic compound. Like I mentioned, this is not the best way of thinking about this, but it's a really easy and simple way to write it. Oh, sorry, hang on. My, it appears my video is stuck. There we go. All right, so the easiest way to think about acids when you put them in water is just that they split up like ionic compounds. Um, technically, though, when you put these in water, what you actually have happen is they wind up reacting with the water itself. And you wind up making, instead of making just H pluses, it turns out H pluses don't like to just float around on their own. We need a base to accept the H plus. And so if water is all you have floating around, water is going to act as the base. And so what you actually make is H3O plus and chloride. And so measuring how acidic a solution is generally comes down to how much of either of these two compounds we have. We don't ever really just have the H pluses around, um, but that's what they originally thought. That's what Arrhenius's original definition of an acid was, was anything that adds H3O plus when you put it in a solution. Um, this is more accurate. So this is the way we use it now. But that's why pH is, is described as pH is because originally they thought they were just talking about H pluses. So if we want to find the pH of a, of a um, solution, all we need to know is this concentration. pH of a solution, P is what we call a mathematical operator, which basically just means it's a function. And the function that it describing. You're frozen uh, again, Sean. I don't know what's going on with that. My video or my audio is still going, right? Yes. Huh. I probably need to reboot my computer when we're done here. Um, this operator, <coughs> a mathematical operator is just a, <coughs> excuse me. Um, is just a function, just, a, just like in an algebra class. And in this case, this particular um, operator, it we just means we take the log, and we take the negative log of something. Um, in this case, we're talking about pH, it's the negative log 
of either the H plus concentration or the better way to write it is H3O plus. Since almost all of our solutions are in water, we measure pH as just a negative log of H3O plus concentration. And so for any acids that, that when we put them in water, if they dissociate 100% of the way, just like we, when we talked about electrolytes, we said strong electrolytes versus weak electrolytes. And the difference was that strong electrolytes, when you put them in water, dissociate 100% of the time. We also have what are called strong and weak acids. And a strong acid is anything that when you put it in water, splits up 100% of the time. So if you have a strong acid, finding the pH of that solution is as simple as just figuring out what your concentration of H3O plus is. And then you just take the log of that. And then it's probably going to have a negative sign on the log and you just drop the negative sign to account for this negative here, right? So for a strong acid solution, all you need to know is what's the concentration of the strong acid. And it's always going to be, the concentration of the strong acid is always going to be one to one with your concentration of H pluses because it will give up that first proton 100% of the time and so you can just say, okay, whatever my concentration of acid is, that's the same as my concentration of H plus. So with that in mind, oh, I left my eraser out on the other side. Um, I'll have to go grab that. There we go. This will work in the meantime. Um, so it's really... It's one additional step. Um, it's, it seems like pH should stand for parts hydrogen, except that if you say parts, then it implies that it's like a percentage and that it's linear scale, but it's actually log. So this lowercase p is, it's related to concentration, but it's because it's the negative log of it, we wouldn't call it parts hydrogen. Um, because this negative sign means that a lower pH is more hydrogen. And if it was parts per million hydrogen or something like that, that would be a linear scale. So we, to avoid a, um, confusing the two, we just use, just call it pH. And specifically, it's lowercase p, uppercase h. Right. And um, I believe that that's about as complicated as this lab gets. Um, there's a list, basically there are only a few strong acids. Um, hydrochloric acid, HCl, is the most common of those. Um, and for this class, we're only gonna deal with pH when it comes to strong acids and strong bases because we are not used to doing any calculations with equilibrium yet all the weak acids and weak bases, they're all equilibrium processes where they don't go 100% of the way. And with that in mind, we're not gonna get into actually doing any of those calculations for this class. Um, so we're gonna mostly be looking at pH of strong acid solutions. And just for reference, the strong acids are hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, um, hydrobromic acid, and we'll go over how these name, where these names come from when we do acid nomenclature on Monday. So HCl, HBr, HI, you can see a theme there. Those are the, the halides except for fluoride. Um, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and perchloric acid, which is hydrogen with perchlorate. Right. These six are the only strong acids. Everything else that has hydrogens attached to it is going to be a weak acid, meaning it'll give up an H plus, 
but not 100% of the time in water. All right, so these are, again, the only ones we're really going to deal with in this class. And the only one that's really tricky that you have to pay attention to, it's not really even tricky, you just have to know about it, is that sulfuric acid, H2SO4, has two hydrogens attached to it, but only the first one is considered a strong acid. So sulfuric acid, H2SO4, is a strong acid, but once it loses one of its protons, the other proton doesn't come off 100% of the time. So we basically ignore the fact that there are two H pluses that it could lose and only treat it for the purpose of finding pH. We ignore the second proton. Because really what will happen if you put this in water, is the first proton comes off 100% of the time. So H2SO4 plus H2O is going to turn into H3O plus and HSO4. And that reaction happens 100% of the time within sig figs. This still could lose another H plus, but it doesn't do it 100% of the time. It does it such a small percentage of the time, we basically ignore the fact that this reaction could happen again, which case it would look like hydrogen sulfate plus water can react to make another H3O plus, and then you'll just have regular sulfate. But this reaction doesn't happen 100% of the time. Hydrogen sulfate is not a strong acid. And so we, we can show that if we're writing this equation out by doing a double-sided arrow, do an arrow forward and an arrow backward to show that it doesn't happen 100% of the time. But basically, all that that means as far as strong acids goes is that we can ignore this bottom one because it happens such a small percentage of the time, it's not gonna meaningfully contribute to the overall H3O plus concentration. So for all of these strong acids, if you know the concentration of the strong acid, that means that you also know the concentration of H3O plus. And if you know the concentration of H3O plus, all you have to do is take the log of that to get your pH. Right, just make sure that it's log base 10, not natural log. You don't want to use the LN button on your calculator. You want to use log. All right, but with that in mind, I believe that's everything you need to know ahead of time. Um, everything else is presented in the simulation. There's, there are a couple new ideas, but I think that they present them pretty well. This is the only mathematical one. Um, that I think you want to know ahead of time. So just so we have a numerical example of show one problem where we're trying to find the pH. Generally speaking, all of these strong acids are either liquids or uh, gases at room temperature, <laughs> excuse me, when they're pure, um, which means we, <laughs> excuse me, it's like I've been talking for two and a half hours or something like that. Um, the fact that they're mostly present as liquids or gases means we don't usually see them as like grams of acid because a gram, we usually, if we were trying to add, you know, five grams of something to a solution, we only really do that for solids. We don't weigh liquids very much, and we don't weigh gases when we try to add them to a solution. So usually, you're going to be given a concentration of your strong acid. So, for instance, if you took, if you had HCl and 
the concentration of your hydrochloric acid was 0 0.015 molar. If we want to know the pH of that, well, because all of these strong acids are one-to-one -one relationship with our concentration of H3O plus, we can just say that our concentration of any of these strong acids is equal to the concentration of H3O plus. There's no funny stoichiometry that happens, and we know that it happens 100% of the time. So we can just say, OK, if I know my concentration of hydrochloric acid, that's the same as my concentration of H3O plus. So if I want to find pH, that's just negative log of H3O plus concentration. So finding pH for this reaction or for this solution, we just take our starting concentration, 0 0.015. We take the log of that and get the log of it and you get negative 1.82. And so we get some pH is equal to negative, negative 1.82. So negative cancels out a negative. So our pH for this solution is just 1.82. All right, about the only way that these can get trickier than that is if we're using up some of our HCl. If we have a reaction happening so that we're, we're using up some of our strong acid, then that's going to change this. It won't stay as this concentration, right? But really, all that is, that's just an excess reactant problem, just like we practiced with stoichiometry, right? pH is, frankly, one of the main reasons we practice excess reactant problems is because if you have leftover HCl and you can find the concentration of it, you know the pH of the solution after something happens, which is a very useful thing to know. Is it still acidic after my reaction happens? And in that case, we would just be looking at how many moles did I start with for the HCl, how many moles did I use up, whatever's left over, we find the concentration of HCl that's left over and take the negative log of that. And that's about the only way that this gets any trickier at this level. Right? Later on, when there's equilibrium involved and it's not, we can't assume it's all strong acid, then there's other things happening. Um, and it gets a little bit trickier, but that's a Gen Chem problem. That's a problem for future you. For now, we're just treating it all like it's stoichiometry, and we just added one new tool. That's really all. Some vocabulary and one new way of measuring concentration. But it's still just based on molarity. And any questions so far? I mean, probably not till you get into the lab and if you ran and run into a brick wall, right? Um, since you haven't really worked with this that much yet. But I think that that's all you need for this lab. In fact, you probably didn't even need my intro, but the lab will make more sense having seen that, that little introduction to pH and strong acids. Um, so have fun with it. Um, and let me I believe that, our, that your homework, you have everything you need for the homework as well. So I'll double check the homework. If I need to make any adjustments, I'll send out an announcement about the homework as well. Um, if there's anything that I need to adjust based on what we covered this week. All right, we'll have at it and uh, I'll be here till five. And if you have at least five, if you guys are still here and working, I'll, I'll, I'll keep sticking around. Otherwise, I'll see you on Monday.
Hey, Sean, just one quick question. Yeah, what's up, David? Um, for the soluble and insoluble chart that you had going before, um, I, I may have missed part of it. Just to clarify, um, insoluble means that there is a solid produced? Correct. Yeah, insoluble means it doesn't dissolve in water. Got it. If it doesn't dissolve in water, it forms a solid. Okay. Um, 